All right, guys, so in today's video, I'm gonna go through this specific RV and use this as a reference for features that you may or may not wanna upgrade to whenever you're looking at an RV. I get asked time and time again from folks via email and in the comments if they should get an RV that has independent suspension, if three inch thick sidewalls is something that's mandatory, if they should go to standard windows instead of frameless windows or frameless windows over standard, full profile roofs, generators, all sorts of questions are asked about, you know, whether or not somebody should look at an RV with this or that specific feature. And I'm going to try to answer some of those now. Keep in mind, though, a lot of those features can add significant cost or may only be offered on higher end units. So whenever you're watching this video, just keep that in mind. And again, this is all my opinion. I'm not trying to force my opinion on anybody. These are just some things that I would observe as areas you could opt for upgrading or even save some money and avoid. Okay, I'm going to extend the slides here for this next part. Get this slide going out. Okay, so now that the slides are extended, this one is gonna really come down to personal preference as well, but I'll explain why some manufacturers do this and some don't. So some manufacturers have elected to go with what they consider to be a flush floor, and that means when the slide arts are out, everything is flush, whether it be on this side or it be on this side, and you can see how it's elevated right here. Now, this is definitely a preference that certain manufacturers choose to go with over others. In some cases, they use carpet. In some cases, they use linoleum that just kind of covers the flap. Some manufacturers who used to offer it no longer offer it simply because of what they call imprinting. And that is this area right here, this gap with vinyl or linoleum tends to imprint over time and you tend to start to see the crease there or the wear and tear mark. So what they do is they double up or they fold it under as a flap to keep that from happening. Some manufacturers, because they want to avoid that altogether and they don't ever want that to happen, they've stuck with carpet or they've moved to carpet. But you're starting to see kind of the resurgence in folks using this flush floor system with linoleum as opposed to carpet. Now, when you look at Van Lee, this specific unit actually doesn't have linoleum as you would typically see, the rolled out style. These are all individually laid tiles and they use the carpet as a means of covering over it whenever the slide is out. But this is all preference. Is one better than the other? Not really. It all comes down to your own personal preference and what you like the look of. Is this an area that I would avoid buying one brand over another because of you know how they do this? Not really. I wouldn't say that one brand is better than another simply because they do this portion differently. And you may miss out on something you really like because you're only looking at a brand that has either one type of floor covering here in the slide versus another. So just keep that in mind. Now, residential versus gas electric versus 12 volt refrigerators. I've done a big segment on this, and this is one of those areas that you can easily become biased towards one simply because of your camping style. Right, so if you do a lot of boondocking off-grid stuff, then gas electric or 12 volt might be ideal for you. If you're primarily connected at RV parks or resorts, then residential is probably gonna be preferred by you. But at the end of the day, it really just comes down to your camping style and maybe what you've used. If you're fans of gas electric because that's just what you've used forever, then stick with gas electric. If you're fans of residential because it cools quicker and it stays cooler longer and it gives you more capacity overall, then stick with residential. The fact is it really comes down to how you plan on using your specific RV and in what conditions and what you're used to. You're also starting to see a big emphasis on the stoves that are in RVs. Keep in mind, anything that's larger takes up more room in a relatively small space. So even though I love the look of these Insigna stoves, I do think that they are larger than they need to be. And we have only used it one time where we've used more than two burners and a three burner cooktop would have been fine for us. Plus, once you have them all open, none of them really work as effectively when they're all open as they do when you're using them independently, which means you're trying to share that one propane line for all of the burners and things tend to take a little bit longer to cook. So that's just something to keep in mind. These stoves and ovens look fantastic though. So if you want more of that residential look and you want more of that residential feel, then this is something that you might wanna get in your coach. 
Now here's a big one, and it's gonna be three air conditioning units. This Van Lee Beacon has three units standard. Some manufacturers only offer one unit. Some offer two and some offer three. Some offer different variations of those as standard equipment. And again, in this Beacon, it comes with three. Does it need three? Yeah, in my opinion, this coach actually needs three, simply because it is incredibly long. There's a lot of isolation between spaces, and air, you know, might not get to one area if it only had two air conditioning units. So having three, especially if you're going to be using this in a climate that's very hot and warm, is going to be a very, very good thing for a unit this long. And this coach is about 43 and a half feet long. So just keep that in mind. When you get to your smaller RVs, one or two units may be fine. Or if you plan on camping in an area where it's more mild in climate, not as humid all the time, having one AC might be perfectly fine for you. But if you have an option for two, I generally recommend taking it. Get both air conditioning units. It's not just going to help cool the unit whenever it's hot outside more efficiently, but it's also going to improve your resale value whenever it's time to get rid of your RV. People want two air conditioning units when they're buying a coach most of the time, and if you have two, it's a big perk over just having one. So that's just something to keep in mind. Three, if you have the option for three, it might not hurt to get a third one, but most of your fifth wheels, most of your travel trailers will generally only have an option for one or two, and I do recommend opting for for two if there is an option for that with the unit you're looking at. Here's another big one, day-night roller shades. If your RV doesn't already come with them, and I say that because a lot of travel trailers and fifth wheels now are putting them in pretty much standard, but day-night would indicate this dark out one and then this more of a see-through transparent one. But if you do have an option to get both, I would highly recommend you do it, simply because you're gonna find out you don't have to put aluminum foil or you don't have to put any of that Astro foil material on your windows anymore. These do a fantastic job of blacking out the RV at night or during the day if you want to sleep in a little bit longer and you want to block the light out they do a great job and then the screened version of them do an absolutely outstanding job of giving you privacy whether it be day or night just keep in mind if it's bright in here at night and it's dark outside you'll still see through these screened ones pretty easily but having both of them in place definitely definitely can give you a lot of cooling capability if it's hot and sunny outside and a lot of privacy if you wanna sleep in a little bit later. So day night roller shades are absolutely one of those things I recommend including on your upgrade list. Now here in the bedroom, king size bed versus queen size bed. Again, this comes down to personal preference. I always opt for a king size bed because it gives you more sleeping area and it's definitely, I think, more comfortable for me where I like to move around. A lot of people opt for a queen size bed because they want more room around the bed and they don't feel they need a king size bed. But this comes down to personal preference. What I can tell you is king size beds are more desirable in the aftermarket if you plan on selling your RV. So when you buy it, if you plan on getting rid of it, having a king size bed is definitely something that's going to make it more marketable and it might make it a little easier to sell for a little bit more money. So that's just something to consider. Now I have the slide in here but behind that door is a washer and dryer. We absolutely love having a washer and dryer on board because it gives us the ability to wash our clothes and do everything we need to do without using the clubhouse and kind of keeping ourselves self-contained in our RV whenever it's time to go or throughout our trip. This is a huge perk for us, but it may not be for most people. If you only plan on going out for a couple of nights, washer and dryer might not be something that you need to even worry about. They're gonna be relatively expensive. You're gonna look upwards of $1,500 to $2,000 to add it and if you just bring a laundry basket with you you can wash your clothes at home or you can use the clubhouse to do it opting for something like this might not be important to you so I'm not going to put this on a need to have list because it's not something you really need to have now here inside of the bathroom, one piece shower. So I talk about this a lot in videos and I bring up the point whether an RV has a one piece shower or not. The only real advantage, really only two advantages that you're gonna get with a one piece shower, one, it's easier to clean, and two, it looks better. That's really it. You're not gonna get really more room out of it. It's not gonna be more durable. Uh, it could actually be more difficult to get repaired or to take out if you need to remove it from the RV for whatever reason, but it's not something I think is mandatory. It's not even something I think you really need. Um, they look great, but you're starting to see a lot of manufacturers now go to this two-piece system that has kind of this fake plastic marble to it that you're seeing in like Alliance units and on some Jayco units. And they look just as nice, except they're a lot easier to work on because they're modular. Now toilets, porcelain toilet versus plastic. 
If the coach you're looking at has a porcelain toilet, good. If it has plastic, doesn't really matter if you're okay with it. Plastic toilets creak more, they're noisier, they're a little bit more difficult to clean, they don't feel quite as stable, but they work. And I think for most people that's all that matters. If you're looking for something more residential feeling, more residential in size, more residential in terms of not creaking, porcelain's kind of the way to go. You're starting to see a lot of your mid to higher brands just include porcelain as standard now. And even on some of your lower entry level fifth wheels, porcelain's pretty much standard as well. Now, smart controls. Smart controls are really becoming more and more popular in the RV industry. You're starting to see companies like ASA and Command put really, really complex and cool systems in that give you all sorts of information about what's going on with the actual coach, give you all your controls, you know, if you have fuses that are blown, all of that stuff. They do a really, really good job of providing you a tremendous amount of information. But I don't think it's something that you have to look for if you're buying an RV. I don't think you need to expect it simply because a lot of brands consider it to be just another thing that could break or another thing that takes time for you to have to get set up whenever you're getting ready to camp or you show up at a campground. Basically, buttons and knobs and all the different things that you expect turning on you know, lights and slides and things like that have been around for a long time. They work really well. They're easier to service and some people prefer that. But if you are a tech geek and you love information, you love getting all your information centrally and you love being able to control things remotely, then having a smart system like this might be beneficial to you. But this all comes down to preference. I personally wouldn't look at it as something I had to have though. So the next one is the roof membrane or the roof construction. There's only a few different types of materials that are used across the industry. You can really narrow it down to only a few different types of roofing materials. Most of them are gonna be a membrane of some sort, whether it's rubber, whether it's TPO, you know, various different types of membranes that are stretched across the top or a solid fiberglass roof construction like you can get optionally on DRVs and on some of your higher end class A motorhomes. Now, a lot of folks will say the roofing material is the area that the RV industry is really challenged the most, that they're using really, really horrible materials. But I would venture to say Say that nine out of ten times if there's a problem with the material up top it was generally how it was installed or something that came in contact with it whenever you were camping let's say you drove on under some really low hanging branches and it tore part of the roof and that tear turned into more of a delamination because air and moisture got underneath it that's where you start to see the majority of the issues that or if the manufacturer just skimped out on installing it correctly they didn't do it properly they really didn't do it the right way and it led to the material delaminating from the roof causing moisture issues and other problems and that tends to be probably the most widely complained about issue in the RV industry. That being said, as long as it was installed properly and you haven't made contact with anything that could have damaged it, typically your membrane roof styles work pretty good. I'll tell you that on the Coachman Chaparral we had, in three and a half years of owning it, when we sold it to our friends, the roof looked brand new. We had no problems at all with it because we took care of it, we got up there and cleaned it, and we made sure that we avoided areas that we could possibly damage it. And you know, that just kind of goes without saying. It's a membrane. Be careful that you could tear it or damage it if you're not cautious of where you travel with your RV. Once it gets torn, if you don't see that tear, if you don't know that it's there, then everything that happens after that point is just going to make it worse and worse and worse until it becomes kind of a catastrophic thing where water's gotten into it and it's damaged more than just the membrane. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so the next one's going to be your hot water system, whether it's a on-demand hot water system like this Truma or whether it's your typical water heater. Now, if you have the option of going with this style system, whether it's a gas or an electric system, I would generally recommend it simply because they tend to be more efficient. That being said, if it is a huge cost increase to do it, then it's not a big deal. Fact is, the standard propane system that's been on RVs for decades has worked just fine. As long as you maintain it, as long as you, you know, change out the anoid rod or the different parts of it that might need to be serviced, as long as you flush it out over time, they tend to work really well well and you'll have minimal problems with it. These are really cool. They work really well. People that have switched to them or gotten an RV that has these on-demand water systems really tend to like them and they work well. But this isn't an area you have to spend the money on. So I wouldn't really say definitely opt for it if it's an option. If you can save some money and you don't feel you'll need it. 
Now this RV does not have a water manifold system and I do think that that's one area that they probably should have put it in. This is definitely at that level where I believe a manifold style water control system should be included. When you look at Riverstone and you look at Redwood, they both have it as standard features on their units. Uh, DRV has it as a standard feature and so does Lux. But when it comes to these beacons, I do think it should be standard on the beacon. Now on the Volano and maybe the lower models and most other RVs in the industry that fall within that $65 to $80,000 price range, not necessarily needed. But if you can find a manufacturer that does utilize a manifold system, that is actually a really, really great feature. Now what Van Lee does that is nice, and it's also something Alliance does, is they put individual valves pretty much everywhere throughout the coach. So if you have a water leak at your sink, you can turn the valve off and cut the water to it. Same at the toilet, the sink in the bathroom. It gives you individual shutoff controls to shut the water off there. But sometimes that's not where the source of the leak is. So having a manifold system where you can kill the water to it, I think is something that most manufacturers should start incorporating into their design. And I think it is a feature that you should start seeing more on your mid-level models and not just on your highest level models. Definitely something I think brands like Van Lee Beacon as well as Alliance and others should probably start to consider adding to their future floor plans. And here's a big one, slide top awnings. I get asked this question all the time. Should people upgrade to slide top awnings? Yes, if you plan on staying in areas with a lot of foliage, a lot of stuff that can drop on top of your slides. Otherwise, you're gonna be up there with a the broom sweeping them off and it's not ideal. Not necessarily if you are gonna be staying in uncovered areas where you don't have trees and things above you and there's the potential for high winds because they can damage your awnings. So it's really hit or miss because I feel most people would stay in both areas, right? In one camping season, you might stay in an area with a lot of trees and foliage above your unit and another camping season or another camping park, you might not have anything above them. But for the most part, I would say it's generally a good thing to get as a precautionary upgrade because it's definitely going to keep the top of your slides much, much cleaner than not having them on there. And you can always pull the slide in if it gets too windy out and you just want to keep from damaging them. And it really needs to be really windy for them to truly get damaged by the wind. But that's just my opinion there. And then we're gonna end by talking about dual pane windows. Do you need them or do you not need them? Now, if you look at the actual R value improvement that you get with dual pane windows, it's very, very minimal. However, if you look at the practical improvement, the actual real improvement of going inside, putting your hand against the inside of the window and feeling how much cooler it is when the sun's been hitting it all day, it's a huge improvement. Most people that comment on videos with RVs that have dual pane windows and they have them on their RV will say they'll never get an RV that does not have dual pane windows again, simply because they offer that much of a dramatic improvement in terms of actual heat not transferring to the inside of your coach. It comes down to personal preference, but it makes the inside quieter if there's a lot of noise outside. It also improves the ability for your window to stop heat from just flooding into your coach. So that's just the things you have to consider whenever you're looking at an RV and you're considering dual pane windows versus standard windows. They are a very, very expensive upgrade, so just keep that in mind. If you're a weekend warrior and it really doesn't matter, or if you live in a milder climate where heat coming from the outside to the inside isn't as big of a deal, then you know, you may not need dual pane windows, or I would probably say you don't need dual pane windows. But if you live in an area where the sun's constantly hitting your RV, you are in the RV a lot, dual pane windows can definitely help. Anyways, guys, I think that just about covers it. If you have any other questions or comments, please leave them below. Again, most of this stuff is gonna come down to your own personal opinion and your own preference. You know, you may view something entirely different than the way I do. You know, baggage doors to you might be okay if they're super thin, whereas I always comment on how thick they are and if I like them to be thicker, things like that. You know, you may have your own view on what you think an RV should come with, the type of upgrades you think are important or not important. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to personal preference. But I hope this video has been helpful. If it has, please give me a thumbs up. Take a moment, subscribe to my channel, and we'll talk to you again very soon.